Good morning everybody. It's eight o'clock in the morning and uh, I haven't got my storytelling hat on today because uh, I've come out for a run. I'm in my running kit and I've run up a hill and I'm right up here and uh, I think I'd like to show you if that's all right what it looks like up here. It's a bit windy. I hope you can uh, you can see I'm up on top of the fells and uh, I'm in Cumbria uh, and I'm staying at a castle called Muncaster Castle uh, all week with my friends Uncle Gacko and Professor Pumpernickel as well. So I thought while I'm here I might uh, bring you up and tell you a story from the top of the hill and what's very special about this story is uh, it's actually uh, from here uh, and if I can just get my camera to come round I might be able to show you off in the distance there, if I can see. Uh, a, I can't point it out, but there's off in the distance over here is where the story takes place. And the story goes something like this. A long time ago, just across the water there, in the land called Ireland, there was a young woman. And the young woman's name was Bega. Now Bega, she wasn't any ordinary girl. She was strong, she was resilient, and she was quick-witted. And she was also the daughter of a king, the king of Ulster. Now, Bega had a, a good upbringing. Her father was a fair man and kind. Troubling news came across the land that the Norsemen were travelling across the world on their great boats and uh, wherever they went, they went Viking, taking people's land. And eventually the Vikings, the Norsemen, they came to Ireland. Well, the king and his soldiers, his men, they went to fight the Norsemen for a while they were hard put to push them back but it didn't take long for the Norsemen to start to push the King of Ulster back towards his castle claiming his land as they went and the King he was worried and one night he called for Bega and he said Bega tomorrow I want you to go to the stables and I want you to take a horse and travel to the coast there's a cove and in that cove I've prepared a boat for you a small bonny light boat with good sails now you know how to handle a boat Bega you climb in that boat and you travel to England for the Lord's there they'll take you as refuge they'll show you kindness well Bega she was so upset at the words of her father she said my Lord I'm as strong as any man and I can handle a sword you've taught me well let me stay and fight by your side but the king said no and he gave Bega that night a gift a small wooden box of no real merit but there was a silver clasp a lock and a little silver key he said Bega you take this box and you go to Ireland you hold on to this box it's precious but whatever you do don't open it you should only open this box when all hope has gone and not before well, she was a dutiful daughter, and the next day she did as her father had told her. She went down to the stables, carrying nothing really but the box and a few other items. And she found a good horse, and she travelled across the land. And after a day's journey, eventually, she came to the cove. And there was the bonny boat. And if this had been any other time, not troubled times, Eager would have taken great joy sailing that boat but these were troubled times and Bega she climbed on the little boat and she pushed it out into the water and she set off well she knew how to handle a boat but a storm raged up and I'll tell you that storm was so ferocious it 
was like it was trying to grasp that boat and turn it and pull it down to the salty depths of the sea. But she steered that boat well, and after many days, many stormy days at sea, she arrived just here, in a place called Fleswick Bay. Well, Fleswick is a bonny beach, and I've been there many times myself, and you can travel there yourself if you like. And what you will find there is you'll find caves, and that's exactly what Bega found. She found a cave, and at night time she crawled into that cave, and she found in there nothing really, just an old stone slab that she could make into a bed. Well, she climbed on the stone slab, and she shivered her first night away. And as she laid there on the stone slab, she thought to herself, well, surely now all hope has gone. But something inside her, a little voice, maybe you've got one of those voices yourself, you just said to her, no, there's always hope. Wait. Well, the next day came, and Bega, she could see the sun had risen, and she left the cave, and suddenly she felt it wash over her, the heat of the sun, and she felt the hope that the sun brings as well and well, she decided to move. She looked around and she could see that behind her, cut into the sandstone, there were some steps. She climbed up the steps and she looked across the land and off there in the distance she could see there was a settlement, she could see smoke rising and she decided that would be the place to go. She travelled inland, not very far, and uh, she found uh, a town and that town's name was Egremont. It still stands this very day. In Egremont there was a castle. It was now but a ruin. But living in that castle was Lord Lowther. And Wobiga well, went to the great gates of Egremont Castle and she rapped hard upon the door. And Lord Lowther, he appeared upon the sill above the door, asked her what she wanted. She said, my lord, I'm the daughter of the King of Ulster. And we're at war. And my father has sent me, telling me that English lords are kind, and here I might find refuge. Would you take me in? Lord Lowther just laughed, and he laughed long. And he said, why would I help a daughter of Ireland? Clear off. Well, Bega travelled all the way back across the land, and she went back to her cave, and she spent the second lonely cold night laid upon the stone slab and as she laid there once again she thought well surely now all hope really has gone maybe i should open the box but something else happened as she laid there she remembered the grinning face of lord lowther and she thought how dare anybody laugh at me for where i'm from i'll teach him and she made a decision and the next day, when the sun came up, she climbed up those stone steps and she travelled back across the land to the castle. And she rapped hard upon the door. Lord Lauder came out. She said, my lord, my father told me that the English lords were kind and here I would find refuge. Will you take me in? Well, he was silent for a while and then he looked at Beaker and he said, listen, I'll do you a deal. You go back to your castle one last night. And when you come back tomorrow, any land that's covered in snow, it'll be yours. Well, Bega looked at Lord Lowther and said, why would you play games with me? This is the height of summer. There's no chance of snow. Well, that's the deal, said Lowther. Take it or leave it. So Bega went all the way back to her cave and spent the third and final night there. And as she laid there on the stone slab, she knew that hope had gone, and she decided to open up the box. She took out the little silver key, and she put it into the lock, and she opened it, and in there was a white cloak. And when she wrapped it around herself, well, well, there was a property inside that cloth that warmed her, just like any firewood. And for the first time, she felt comfortable. She felt safe. Well, after a good night's rest, she woke up and she went out onto the beach and she looked around. She wondered where to go. 
Maybe she should head north and find some other lord that might take her in. And so she climbed up the stone steps. But the heat of the sun and the warmth of that cloak meant that by the time she got to the top, she had to wipe her brow. She decided to take the cloak off. She undid the clasp at her neck and then she flicked the cloak just before she prepared to fold it. And that's when the magic of the cloak was revealed. That cloak, it spread. And it spread as far as the eye could see and it landed on the ground and settled. And for all intents and purposes, as she looked, didn't it look like freshly fallen snow? And when Lord Lowther came out onto his sill and looked across the land, he saw Bega walking towards him and he couldn't believe his eyes. But true to his word, he gave the land to Bega. And it's been Bega's land ever since. And I can see it just here, although the camera wouldn't pick it up. A little place called St Bees, which is just above Fleswick Bay. And it's called St Bees after Bega, St Bega, because eventually she was made into a saint. And you can follow the trail of Bega inland until eventually you come just over the top of the hills there to the only lake in the Lake District. Some of you might not have known that either. And that's Bassenthwaite Lake. All the rest of the waters of the Lake District are mirrors and waters, not lakes. He came to Bassenthwaite Lake. And if you go to Bassenthwaite Lake and you go to the far side of Bassenthwaite Lake and look carefully, you'll see that there's a little church there and that's called Bega's Church. And if you go into Bega's Church, this is the good bit, there's a stone slab and the story that I've just told you is carved into the rock of that stone slab. So if you ever travel up here to Cumbria and you go to Bassenthwaite Lake and you amaze your friends with the knowledge that there's only one lake and I'm stood next to it now, you find that church and go inside and, uh, well, you'll know that as always what I've just told you is true. So there's the end of my little story. I hope you enjoyed the story from the top of the hill here. I'm going to run back down now and go and have uh, some breakfast. And um, we've got a good story coming up next. Uh, my wife Jo is busily making some more shadow puppets, so we're going to do another shadow show for you uh, for the next video. So, but for now, from Eureka at home and from Ian the storyteller, much love and much light. And I think we should have one last glimpse of the landscape up here. There you go, looking out over Beagle's land. And then I'll take it across the hills. I hope you can still hear me. Scarfell's off in the distance there. And my journey takes me back down the hill there. So, ta-da for now. Bye-bye.